You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number one. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gautier. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast. Today, I have the chance to chat with international violin soloist James Ennis. In this episode, he talks about the essence of what mindful instrumental practice is, having a clear goal, work efficiently, listen intently, and connect with others. You will also hear about his experience with building an international career and finding balance in his life. James is one of the most prominent violinists in the field, and he is a favorite guest of renowned conductors such as Vladimir Ashkenazi, Marin Alsop, and Sir Andrew Davis. You can hear him regularly on the best stages across the world, including Wigmore Hall, Carnegie Hall, Chicago Symphony Center, and Amsterdam's Concert Gebouw. His discography is incredibly impressive and has collected countless honors, including a Grammy and Juno Awards for his recording of the Carngold Barber and Walton Violin Concerti and a nomination for a Gramophone Award for his rendition of the Bartok's Violin and Viola Concerti. I am so very happy and honored to begin this adventure of the Mind Over Finger podcast with someone that I see as both an incredible artist and human being. I know that you will be inspired by James' insight and wisdom. Let's go to the show. James Ennis. It's such a treat to have you on the podcast. Well, it's great to talk with you. Uh, you're definitely, um, I would say, one of my favorite artists on both violin and viola, actually. Although I hear you're also very quite proficient on the piano. Hmm. I've sort of, I've, uh, I'm in retirement <laughs> from playing the piano. It takes too much practice. <laughs> Um, and you know, I think I, I don't want to make you blush there, but I think you're probably one of the smartest and also funniest people I know. So you've been a great source of inspiration forever for me. So great to have you. Oh, thank you very much. It's, we've been friends a long time. It's, it's, uh, crazy to think of just how long now. I know, you know, I don't know if you know this, the first time I saw you perform live, and this was after hearing your name so many times. I believe I was 14, so you were not much older, and you were on this tour with the Jeunesse Musicale, and you came to my hometown in Chicoutimi, and there was a huge snowstorm, and I think you were crossing the park with Louis-André Barry, mm -hmm. and you guys were late for the concert, so we just waited patiently in the hall. You came in through the hall wearing your, you know, your normal clothes, and you were so gracious and just said, uh, just give us a minute to change and we'll be right back. And if I remember correctly, the first thing on the program was um, Sarasade's Carmen Fantasy, and you were, you just nailed it. And I was so impressed. And, you know, I think that to this day, that was probably a concert that was so profoundly inspiring for me. I think it was a key moment in maybe my decision making to in becoming a musician myself. Oh, so. Wow, that's uh, <laughs> that's so nice of you to say. I wish I could say that that was the only concert on that tour that we were late for, but <laughs> we were we ran into <laughs> all sorts of uh, of weather, and you know that's a funny thing about performing, right? You you um you kind of have to roll with it, and uh, and I'm glad that that I made the audience feel sort of comfortable. And, and I think that's a huge part of, uh, of performing is making people feel like you want to be there and that you're all going to be sharing in something special. Yes, absolutely. I could not agree more. This It makes a really big difference in how we listen to the music when the person on stage makes us feel like they are in control and enjoying themselves. Yes, that's very true. So again, thank you so much for being here today. Shall we dive in? Talk a sure. bit about practicing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, James, you've had such a remarkable career so far. And I think a personal goal of mine is to buy every one of your 50-something records. <laughs> 
And, um, you know, you're so young and there's still many, many awesome years ahead and awesome things ahead for sure. Um, I would like to hear about your artistic journey in your own words, if that's okay with you. So if you don't mind, would you please talk to us a little bit about your story, how you got to where you are and how your musical path has unfolded? Well, um, as you know, I am Canadian and uh, I was born in a city in Western Manitoba called Brandon, which um, is really, it's a city by Canadian standards. Uh, when I was living there, it was maybe <laughs> 35, 40,000 people, but it uh, services quite a big geographic area. So there's more in, there's a lot more in Brandon than there might be, say, in a, in a U.S. city of similar size. Uh, including a really wonderful university with a, a great school of music. And that was actually what brought my parents to Brandon in the first place as well. My father was the trumpet professor at Brandon University. And one of his very dearest friends was Francis Chaplin, the violin professor there. Um, due, due to a large part of um, Francis Chaplin's influence, but, but also really historically the area um, has been producing violinists and it's it's uh, it's a strong kind of violin center and has been for for generations so because of those things um there was kind of a robust suzuki program around and i started playing the violin it was something i really wanted to do which is still a little bit of a family mystery why it is that i chose the the violin over all other instruments but uh, I, f I was asking for one for what seemed like ages, and I finally got a violin for Christmas just before my fifth birthday. And uh, my first teacher, actually my first several teachers were students at the university. So as they would graduate, I would have to find a new teacher. And uh, my very first teacher was not um, a Suzuki style teacher, but then my next one uh, was and I ended up going through all ten books of the Suzuki program, and that was kind of my my introduction to playing the violin. And I, oddly enough, this makes me feel really old, but I met Doctor Suzuki in Edmonton in 1984 or something like that. There oh, was wow. the yeah the Suzuki World Conference or some such thing, and uh, my family drove out from Brandon to Edmonton and. I mean, that was kind of a surreal thing. My my brother, who also played, he, he and I were, for the, maybe the first time, just surrounded by so many kids with the same the same interests and the, the same passion, and, and that was that was fun. And but even in Brandon, there was a really nice group of kids that all studied violin together. Some of whom have um, gone on to really great professional careers as well, and uh, and have remained close friends. Uh, so it was around, um, I guess I was about eight when uh, it was my, not actually through my father that I was first introduced to Francis Chaplin uh, because my, my father had too much respect for him to, uh, to dare ask him, you know, to listen to his little boy son. But it was um, a woman named Lise Elson, kind of a prominent Canadian violin teacher that came through Brandon and she heard me play and she called up Francis Chaplin and said, you should listen to this boy. And my dad was quite embarrassed about the whole thing, but, uh, but thrilled when <laughs> Francis Chaplin uh, agreed to take me on as a student. And um, there was another very, very special man in Brandon uh, who was on the faculty of music named Donald Henry, who was a piano teacher and became my, my piano accompanist and my piano teacher and my general sort of coach. And, it was really the these three men, Francis Chaplin and, and Donald Henry and my father, that were, I guess, the main musical influences on me as a as a boy. And Francis Chaplin had been a student of Galamian at Juilliard back in the late forties, early fifties. And uh, when he was there, he was friends with a, a slightly younger classmate named Sally Thomas, who uh, was both of our teachers, Renee, uh, and um, she taught at, uh, and still teaches to this day, at, at the Metamount School of Music, and it was, I guess, in spring of 89 that uh, I was, had just turned 13, and uh, Dr. Chaplin and my father and 
well, my parents, they, they thought it might be a nice thing for me to go to one of these intensive summer camps. So uh, on his advice, uh, we uh, it sent me off to Meadowmount uh, to study with Sally Thomas, his old classmate. And uh, Meadowmount became a really special place for me and continues to be a very special place for me. I'm actually on the board now, which is pretty funny. And I saw some, saw some great pictures of you there this summer as well. Yeah, I was just there a couple of weeks ago, actually, and the, the place looks looks beautiful. Um, so I spent four summers there uh, working with Sally Thomas. So then when I finished high school, it became a very natural thing for me to continue my studies with Sally Thomas. And uh, I went away to New York at the Juilliard School where Francis Chaplin had been years ago. So there was a certain um, obvious lineage, I guess, to to my uh, my private instruction. And um, in those sort of teenage years, that was, I guess you'd say, when my career sort of got started. You know, when I was 11 or something, I think I did my first national competition. I, I won the, the CMC competition, got to play with an orchestra. And I, I did these kinds of competitions like in Quebec City and Montreal and Minnesota and the, the old CBC competition that was in Ottawa that... I was um, attracted to, or I should say, I was I was guided to by these these people that kind of gave me such great guidance, like my teacher and my father, and to pursue competitions that would give me performing opportunities and performing experience, um, both for the for the value of of those experiences, but also as a way to get a little bit of exposure. I think that being from Western Manitoba, um, it's it's a little bit harder to kind of get get out there and have people hear you than if you're from Montreal or Toronto or something like that. So um, I, I did a few of these kind of national competitions and I uh, had success in those and got some great opportunities to, uh, to start playing in different places and, and working my way through the, the repertoire. And it, it was a competition in Toronto when I was, I think, grade 11 or something that uh, I won this competition in Toronto and at the winner's dinner, I got sat next to this man, Walter Homburger, who was one of the um, legendary empresarios. He um, ran the, the recital series in Toronto, the big series for years and years and years. And he managed the Toronto symphony and, and uh, perhaps most notably, he was the, only concert manager of Glenn Gould during Glenn Gould's performing career. And oh, wow. um, anyway, Walter took uh, an interest in me. He had recently retired and I think maybe he was getting a little bored and um, he offered to help me out to, you know, to manage me and, and look after me and sort of guide me through the, the complicated process of establishing a career. And um, Walter was an amazingly important person in my life uh, who established my career in a very methodical kind of way, which I think was very valuable. You know, I never had one of those kind of moments where all of a sudden I had, you know, quote, a career, you know, lots of mm -hmm. concerts to play or things like that. It was, it was quite gradual. And I think because of that, it's laid uh, a very nice foundation. Um, there's a lot of places now that, you know, now that I'm in my early forties that I've been playing for a long, long time. And I feel this sort of broad base for my career, which is very, very valuable. I think that sometimes, you know, you'll hear stories about someone who wins some big competition and they have one or two seasons where they've got lots and lots of concerts, but then there's no, there's no real base. So once they're not sort of the novelty of the day, it becomes, um, a lot more difficult. So I feel very fortunate the way my, my career developed and uh, looking back on it, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> That's really wonderful. I, I love how um, you talk about the presence of these five people in your life, you know, from your father to Mr. Chaplin and Henry and Humberger and Miss Thomas. And, you know, one thing you said too, is how, being methodical, but also go slowly, you know, gradually and establishing a strong foundation is so, so important. I should also mention, you know, that, that uh, 
my mother was not a musician, but, um, but she was a ballet dancer. And I learned so much from her as well about, you know, commitment to an art form and, and perseverance and dedication and all that. So you, even though there was not that direct musical, um, connection, uh, she was also, of course, a huge part of, of my, my success in the arts world. Oh, that's, yeah, this connection between the different artistic disciplines is so, is so strong. And I'm guessing it must have had some sort of influence on you on how you developed as an artist as well. I think so. Yeah, I, I think that that the devotion to, um, to an art form, it's, a, it's a specific kind of, of devotion and work ethic. And seeing that in both of one's parents is Uh, yeah, very a very valuable thing, and um, of course we're going to be talking about how to practice, and I think that that was that was a huge part of my parents' lives is how to how to practice their art forms and how to improve and and uh, yeah, being around that maybe made um, made learning that very valuable skill somewhat easier for me. Yeah. So speaking about practicing, great segue. How about we jump right into it? What do you think? Sure. Um, I think that you and I would both agree that maybe moving the bow on the strings for hours doesn't mean that you've actually practiced, you know? Um, yeah. And I always see a very interesting correlation between how um, this awareness and how being intellectually involved a musician is in his or her practice and uh, how well or quickly he or she um, overcomes the challenges of a score technically and musically. Um, I find that the practicing habits we establish as young children, you know, the foundational habits that you talked about, they can really profoundly shape who we become as musician. And as we were just talking yeah, about, yeah, this, I mean, this is probably true for any discipline, What are some of the key elements uh, in regards to practice and work ethic that you find really impacted your development as a young violinist? You know, I think that a, a quality that, that I have that I think has been helpful in a funny way is um, that I don't, um, I'm not happy just practicing the violin <laughs> there's too many other things that I want to do with my life and uh, people I want to be with and experiences I want to have that um, that efficiency has always been really really important to me like if I've I've always um, I've always felt and I suppose I was I was kind of raised this way that that practicing should be goal oriented. And certainly if you get too caught up in the idea of it being directly related to time, to the time spent at the instrument, um, that can be, that can be a, a dangerous way of looking at it. It can, it can almost be counterproductive. I mean, you, you come across so many, so many kids that it's like they, they are punching in their time clock. Oh say, my well, gosh. I want yes. to be good. So I'm going to practice this amount of time and, just the, the drudgery of that. And they're not really concerned about what they actually accomplish in that amount of time. It's just like, well, I did my two hours, so I'm going to get better. And um, my, uh, my father, for sure, like from the, the early days was always giving me little challenges of, you know, what could I learn? What could I accomplish? And it, it wasn't within the parameters of, of, a, of a certain time limit except it might be, you, you know, a day or something. Like I, I remember uh, one, one time him, him going away to, to work for, for the evening and um, he was teaching some lessons or conducting the band or something. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to be away all evening. Can you learn this piece tonight? You know, some little Suzuki piece. And um, he sort of laid down that challenge. And I remember thinking, well, A, I have to, rise to the occasion and, uh, you know, pr prove to my dad that I can do it. But also I thought, well, there are other things I want to do tonight. Um, so <laughs> I want to, you know, maybe, and then maybe it became watch that, some baseball. that question. <laughs> yeah. Right. It could be all sorts of things. And <clears throat> I remember thinking, well, 
maybe if I'm really, really efficient and if I practice really carefully and if I'm really focused, I can do both. And, uh, and that's really, that's, I, I think that maybe there's a part of me that, that is always kind of looking for these shortcuts and, <laughs> you know, later it would become this sort of thing where it was like, Hmm, I really want to hang out with my friends and go to the park and play tennis or whatever it would be. But I really want to learn this piece too. You know, can, can I do this efficiently and quickly and waste as little time as possible. And Sally Thomas was really brilliant um, in my my teenage years, you know, at, at Meadowmount when I, I, you know, I was having so much fun with my friends and wanted to do this and that and the other thing. And, and she would give me these little challenges of, you know, well... I thought that maybe maybe you could perform this piece next week on the concert, but then I thought, no, you don't have enough time to get it ready. And then, of course, that was <laughs> the sort of thing, exactly what I needed to hear. I'm like, I can do it, I can do it. And, um, you know, it, it, practicing in a focused way, if it becomes your habit, um, then you get better at it. Like, I mean, you can practice practicing, if that makes sense. Like Absolutely, anything that you, yes. Anything that you practice carefully, you will get better at. And if one of those things that you're practicing is how to practice, then you'll get better at practicing. I, I feel like almost saying amen right here. <laughs> 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 what you said is so true, being goal-oriented. And again, to quote you, so many people do what you said. They punch in their time and feel like, okay, I'll just go in there and move my arms around for a little bit and... Um, I really, I think that's such a gift that your father gave you to really have this focus on efficiency and that question, what you, what you said, what else, you know, it's a concept I use in my teaching with students is the concept of beginner's mind to always search the way, the, the way an, an amateur approaches a new hobby. What else can I try? What else can I find? Or um, how better can I get this? I, I love this. I love this so much. Um, well, my, my dad had some very sort of specific things that, um, that he would, that he taught me in those early years about, about how to practice in some, some, really obvious philosophies that I think are, are neglected too often. I mean, a lot of times students don't really analyze where the problem is. They, they say this movement is hard, or then they might get more specific and say, well, these two pages are hard, or they might even be like, this half page is hard, but very rarely do you meet a student who's, aware enough to say this shift or this string crossing or whatever it may be that this is the spot and everything hinges on that because really I mean once you get to to a certain level of proficiency I think that more more often than not I mean vastly more often than not a passage that is difficult is difficult because of a couple of little kind of pivot spots that everything hinges on that. Like people say, well, I can't play this run. It's like, well, what, what can't you play? And if you really break it down, there's maybe one shift or one string crossing or one awkward moment that kind of destroys the whole thing. So really knowing where the problem is, isolating the problem, fixing it, or at least f figuring out how to fix it. Um, you know, Knowing your enemy <laughs> is a big is a big thing, you know, analyzing exactly what that problem is and then kind of coming up with a solution um, instead of, you know, so often you'll, you'll hear people practicing and there will be, say, a, you know, a big technical run and they'll play it and it sounds bad and they'll play it again and it still sounds bad and they'll play it again. And, you know, like with the hope that if they just play it enough times, it'll get better. And so they'll play it 20 times in a row. And all that they've done is practiced 20 times playing it wrong. Yes. <laughs> like they, they are solidifying their bad habits. They're solidifying their mistakes. And, um, that then, you know, for every time you repeat it poorly, it's going to take an extra repetition of doing it correctly to sort of retrain yourself. So I, I am a big believer in really analyzing where the problem is um, 
and uh, and then working on that little spot and then kind of working outwards from there. And I remember my father working with me uh, as a, as a boy with, with things like this, you know, he would have me fix a very, very isolated thing, you know, maybe even uh, two or three notes. And then we would say, start just a few notes earlier and continue a few notes after the problem point, and then start a little further back and continue a little further on. So you're sort of building out from the, uh, from the former flaw um, until it becomes very natural. And then I think also over, over time, you, you begin to realize how many times you might need to repeat it correctly for it to then feel natural because sometimes that can be also very frustrating where you play it and you're like oh it's fixed it's great and then you go on and then the next day it's completely not fixed again so you haven't really locked it in place yes your your father was a very wise man or is a very wise man <laughs> yeah i think so you know going back to something you said earlier actually something you, you just said made me think about it because you mentioned competitions and I feel a little bit that for me, they were such a great tool for growth because of precisely this um, focus that you bring to efficiency, right? You go to school, there's a lot of things to do. You still want to play with your friends, but you prepare for a competition and all of a sudden it brings into light all of these little details that you want to pay attention to. Uh, what is your position yeah. on competitions as tools for growth? Well... I mean, I've never, I've never enjoyed competitions. I mean, the only enjoyable thing about a competition is is winning. <laughs> but <laughs> I think, um, but I think they are useful in that, as you say, they are a good way to focus your attention, um, th to give you a goal to work towards, um, to yeah, uh, to have to have your eye on a certain, on a certain event that's coming up. Um, I think that that can focus the mind in a, in a very necessary way. And, and also, you know, from just from a career standpoint, um, if it is a way to, to get exposed to people that, you know, that's, that's important. It, it's really hard to know as a young person, how do you get how do you get noticed? How do you get anyone to pay attention to what it is you're doing? And, uh, and also, you know, th these competitions that where performances are a part of the prize, uh, I'm a big believer in, in those sort of philosophically, because, mm -hmm. um, having the opportunity to perform, I mean, is, is kind of the greatest educational tool one could hope for. I know that, um, you know, when I was, well, you mentioned the, the first time you heard me play when I did these, these recital tours for Jeunesse Musicale when I was 16 and 17, you know, playing recitals in different towns, different conditions, um, different challenges, you know, night after night, uh, I learned so much from those experiences and right. grew so much through those experiences. And, um, you know, we can talk about this a little bit as well, but, um, you can't just learn how to play your instrument and expect that things will just happen for you. You know, I mean, you have to find opportunities and you have to make opportunities. And, and then of course you have to take advantage of whatever opportunities you do have. Um, so I think that um, for some people, you know, competitions are, uh, they're an entree into, into the world of performing. And if that's uh if that's what it takes, then, then I'm, then I'm for them. Yes. Oh my gosh. You know, you're, you're dropping these uh, truth bombs all over the place. Um, <laughs> everything you're saying is so true. And, and I hope that all of my students get to hear it, but it's, as you say, I think that oftentimes we learn the violin when we really need to spend so much more time thinking about how, we're practicing and how we're understanding. And again, as you said, seeking these perform performance um, opportunities is so crucial. The performing is something that can be practiced as much as, you know, learning a specific shift. Yeah. And I think that um, <clears throat> the more comfortable you 
are well the more comfortable you are but also the the better understanding you have of of a performance atmosphere that helps you with your practicing away from performing too um i'm thinking about well there have been actually a number of instances where where kids have come up to me and they've said i you know i i don't know what to do because i practice and I get my repertoire to a point where it just seems bulletproof. You know, like I, I can play it in the practice room over and over. I can play it in my sleep. I don't even have to think about it. And then I get up on stage and I'm second guessing everything and I feel like I'm not prepared. And I know I am prepared, but, you know, how do I get past this? And and I think, well, gosh, it's it's so sad because they have practiced getting to a point mentally that they will never be in that place when they're performing. Like the, the whole concept of being like, Oh, I could play this piece in my sleep. You know, I don't even have to be paying attention and I play through it. It's like, well, what good does that do you? Because you're never going to be on stage like asleep or mentally half (laughs) there. (laughs) You know, I think that when you're, when you're on stage, you have a heightened sense of focus. And when you're practicing, you have to be in that same frame of mind. I mean, if if you're not practicing in the same frame of mind as when you're performing, then you're not really practicing doing the same thing yes. at all. Um, and and I think that um, you know the more you perform, the more aware you are of that feeling of kind of really being locked in the zone and this kind of heightened consciousness, and that helps you recognize that mindset in your practice sessions as well and so hopefully one's practice sessions can at least some of the time be more accurate replicas of an actual concert situation that's so true and and how does that work for you right now with the productivity and you know maximizing time in the practice room when you seem to be juggling you know you have a family life a really busy travel schedule and a very large list of repertoire and you do all sorts of things with concerti and recitals and uh, chamber music as well how does that work for you well um (laughs) sometimes sometimes the balance feels great sometimes it seems very complicated you know life is is funny i think that really part of part of living one's life is trying to figure out figure out the the best balance in your life all the time and you might make certain self realizations and say yeah this is this is the way that I want to live my life this is the way I want to pursue my career this is the balance of of work and play and whatever it may be. So then you, you maybe try to implement that and put that in place. And maybe by the time that you have, maybe your life has changed and you're looking for something a little different. And I think in the music world that um, that's sort of a constant challenge because even if you're lucky enough to have control over the elements of your performing career, um, it takes a while to, to put them into place. And by the time they're in place, you know, maybe things have changed. And certainly there's no bigger game changer than, than having a family. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I have two kids and, and I want to spend as much time with them as I can. And I, I've been so lucky to, to get to travel with my family a lot. But, I mean, there's, <laughs> there are a few things quite as crazy as, you know, traveling around the world with a couple of kids and then trying to trying to perform at the same time and learn other repertoire. And you you talk about trying to, to be efficient. I mean, now I feel like I have to be more efficient than ever just to, uh, to juggle all the things that I want to do. You know, and I'm not, I'm not complaining about it. Like it's sort of like a sport (laughs) in the performing musician world to be like, Oh, I'm so busy. You know, and I just, uh, my life is so crazy. You know, I'm never home. I'm always on airplane. And it's like, oh, come on. You know, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. You know, the fact is I love I love my life and I love being able to do what I do and I feel very lucky. So I'm not complaining, but I but I will will say that that it um it requires a certain amount of juggling of resources, that's for sure. And that that can be challenging, but it also can be very rewarding. You know, James, when I think of you're playing, you know, what comes to mind is um, 
well, from my perspective, it's always technically flawless, but it goes way beyond that when I hear you play. I find your approach and interpretations, they are always, in my opinion, again, just so elevated. I, well, I'm a big fan, as you can tell. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about how the process is for you to take a piece from start to finish, you know, technically, but also maybe I'm sure you spend a lot of time thinking about the intellectualist aspect, but um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, for me, um, I want to, I want to know pieces from, if you were to, to make a kind of a strange metaphor, I would say sort of like from an aerial view, you know, like I want to be able to look down and see the whole thing, kind of how it, how it works. And, um, you know, music, of course, as you're experiencing it is, is quite linear as a listener, you know, you're hearing moment after moment, but I think as a performer, in order to know how to best guide the audience through this narrative, um, you have to know, very clearly like where you're going and what what your destinations are and where you've come from and how it all unfolds. So, you know, a lot of people use the term of architecture in music. And and I think that that is something that, that is very important to me. Certainly when I'm first learning a piece, like say if it's a new piece that uh, maybe, maybe is a a piece that's just been written uh, my process is just to kind of slash through it as best I can, not getting really caught up in in the weeds, so to speak, like just slashing through it, getting a sense of how the piece works, you know, what the what the shapes are, what the proportions are, and getting, you know, a kind of a vague sense like that. And then maybe my next stage is working through it more methodically bit by bit um finding the parts that from a technical standpoint are going to be most challenging most intricate and um and sort of figuring out how i'm going to negotiate those spots you know just kind of technically learning learning them to to a reasonable level of proficiency so you know really that's that's the sort of the the grunt work the drudgery of just the nuts and bolts of figuring out how to play uh, certain parts. And then I guess it gets into learning bigger passages, you know, whether it's, you know, a, 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 even something no, no bigger than a, than a phrase, but then, you know, maybe getting into sort of a musical paragraph or maybe an entire exposition or development, you know, a lot larger section, and then eventually, you know, getting comfortable with, whether it's the entire movement or even the entire piece. Um, and often I find if I can, it's to my advantage to learn a piece kind of to say 90% ish, like not, not really quite performance ready, but to the point of knowing it pretty well. And then if I have the, the time and the, the ability to do so, I'll put it away for a while and um, just kind of let it sit because I find that when I come back to a piece uh, that last five, 10%, whatever it is, comes more naturally than, um, than if I'm trying to really learn it to performance level from the very beginning, that those last stages of a piece can sometimes be, be the hardest for me. So I feel a little bit of distance and, uh, and a little bit of perspective kind of helps out. And over the years, I mean, I think that, that every performer gets to know in this weird kind of sixth sense kind of way, they, you begin to know where you need to be at a particular point in time. You know, like I know if I'm learning a piece, like where I need to be a couple weeks before that performance or where I need to be, say, four or five days before that performance. Um, I suppose that's probably something that, that comes not just by, you know, the experience of performing a lot, but probably you learn things from poorly negotiated decisions <laughs> along the way. But um, but I, I really think that it, that that's 
that's something that I don't even know that it can be taught. You know, I think that that feeling, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Where, you know, okay, it's not, it's not perfect today, but the performance isn't today. The performance is in X days and I am about where I need to be right now. And uh, I, I rely on that mechanism a lot because I think that if you're trying to do something that you're just, kind of not ready to be at that spot um then it becomes very very difficult and just um you know if you don't if you don't have to be pushing yourself beyond your natural mechanisms then obviously that's going to make life a lot oh that's so true and you know you touched on a point that i think is so important um that i you know probably did the same as a student but i see it a lot is how sometimes students wait for to get all the answers from us. And I think that it's so important, this self-knowledge that you have to go to the lesson, but then go home and explore within yourself and and find where this guidance that you got in the lesson fits in your own playing and in your own process. I feel like there needs to be an internalization of the notions that is, is not always happening. And um, thank you so much for bringing it up. I think it's such an important aspect. Well, I think that in a way, the, the most important thing that we really need to, to learn um, as musicians, it sounds so obvious, like it, it, it's almost embarrassing. And I'm sure that there will probably be listeners that going to say that it's you know, the most moronically obvious thing to say but we really need to learn how to listen to what we actually mm-hmm. sound like um we get so caught up as instrumentalists in what we're doing that we very often lose fact of lose sight of of what it actually sounds like and we have ideas about what we think we sound like, or we have, you know, these projections, like I want to sound like this. So therefore I am sounding like this. And, you know, sadly you see it in, you see it a lot of, of, among students where, you know, there'll be a group of students and say, Oh, so-and-so, well, you know, they're technically, they're not so great, but they're very musical. Mm-hmm. They're very musical. And sadly, a lot of times what that means is they don't play well, but they really love music and they make a lot of faces when they play. You know, it's like, well, you can love something and really, you know, like I see this sometime with students where I can see that I can see how much it means to them and I can, I can feel how much it means to them in this sort of this kind of physical struggle that they're going through. But if you just listen to it, it's like, I'm sorry, it's just not coming across. And and it's because they have become confused by, I think on the one hand, they're, they are measuring the output by the intensity of the Mm -hmm. input. And, um, and uh, I think that, you know, the biggest challenge that, that I often give to students is to just really listen to your playing, to try to be as objective as possible and say, well, listen to yourself as if you were listening to someone else. Is that really what you want it to sound like? And it's, it's a really difficult thing to ask of someone. I mean, I think most professionals, they don't, all we're ever trying to do is get as close as we can. We, we're trying to approximate the ideals that we actually might have in our in our minds. Um, but just wanting to sound beautiful is not is not the answer, you know. And and I think that if you know what you actually sound like, that's the first step in learning how to sound like what you want to sound. So true. So true. So true. (laughs) You're so good, James. This is great. Um, (laughs) You know, do you, um, do you have any other activities outside of music that you find 
contribute to your growth as an artist? I don't know if you, maybe a sport or a hobby. And I mean, your family, of course, I'm sure. And, but you, do you have any other creative outlet? Um, I don't know. We all have our, our hobbies. I think that as far as things that maybe have some sort of influence on, um, on my music making or my, my art, artistic personality, um, I think it's maybe interactions with, with people. And, um, you know, if we, if we feel like we know our audience, then, then we know how to reach them, you know? And I, I think that sometimes when people are performing or, or starting to perform, part of the discomfort is not feeling like it's somehow appropriate to to share uh something as in a way something as intimate as um as so much of of musical art can be um so i i don't know i think being around uh people that are that are passionate about the arts i think that 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 kind of helps me understand how to um how to reach people better as a as an artist myself and uh, like just yesterday for example i, I played a, a very interesting concert last night in this beautiful it was just a private concert in this beautiful castle in scotland and uh, you know it was really kind of a warm-up in if in a sense for this uh, recital that i'm playing at the edinburgh festival in a couple days um, but, uh, this wonderful pianist friend of mine, Stephen Osborne, uh, he and I thought, well, it'd be a valuable thing to kind of play the program through for some people. And we were just in this beautiful, beautiful home, um, with about 20 or so really interesting and elegant people that, that all had, you know, we all had this shared interest in this beautiful music. And it was so clear in that setting that we were sort of messengers of, uh, we were, how to say this, we were communicators. We we were bringing a musical message to these people. And it wasn't about, you know, sometimes you go into a big concert hall and it's like, oh, you know, is the piano perfect? And is the, the stage placement perfect? And well, how are the acoustics? And am I technically, is everything happening the way I want it to be? And those things can get in the way sometimes of, of remembering that the message is one of, of communication. And uh, I think that that is such a, such an important thing to remember. And a huge moment in my more recent life was uh, when my, my first child, my daughter was, was born and she was just this little, this little bug, you know, and I would, when I would play the violin, she, she would kind of get this look like she was focusing on these sounds and it was the same look that she had when she would hear me speaking or to hear, hear my wife speaking and it was this realization that she didn't understand what I was saying when I was talking and she maybe didn't understand what this music was that I was playing either but she recognized that it was a form of communication that they both were forms of communication and to her the music and the words, they were in the most sort of basic animalistic way. They were the same thing. They were both methods of communicating a certain message. And I thought, wow, that is something that we should never, never forget. You know, that we, that's what we do here. We're communicating a message that the beauty of that message is that it's one that cannot be expressed in words, but it is something of, of importance and, and of value. Oh. That's so true. I mean, what you're talking about really is the essence of of the arts, not just music. You know, it's bringing our humanities together like this and these exchange. And, you know, going back to, to your background with Suzuki, that's one of the things he talks about a lot, too, about how he raises human uh, human beings through music. And oh, what a great answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course. You know, I could keep you here all day, but I know you're you're very busy. So um, 
I'll get you on your way, but how about a quick round of rapid fire questions? Would that work for you? Okay. All right. So um, we've talked a little bit about how, uh, you know, your life looks like as a soloist. We can call you an international soloist. Um, but for the people who are dreaming of becoming, you know, let's say a soloist like this, what do you think would be um, one thing that they would need to really be prepared for? Um, you have to be prepared to deal with a lot of airports and to deal <laughs> with a lot of logistical frustrations. And you have to, you have to be able to meet a lot of people. Uh, if you're not comfortable meeting a lot of different people and being in a lot of different social situations, then the life will be very difficult because that is just a big part of what it is. Right. And how about a performance that stayed with you throughout the years? Is there one? You know, there've been so many. It's um, it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint them. Sometimes they're at the most unexpected times. Um, one that really stayed with me is is not even one where there was a solo performance at all, but it was a performance when I was at Juilliard of uh, Mahler's Third Symphony, where I was the concertmaster and some of my very closest friends were were in the orchestra with me, and it was um, one of the great. Um, one of the great experiences of of sort of a, a collective feeling of of beauty and accomplishment. Uh, I know that even all these years later, when I uh, come across people that I was in school with that were in that same performance, we all remember that so fondly. It was one of those things where I think it meant a very great deal to all of us. And maybe none of us know exactly why, but it was uh, very special. Oh, that's great. Once again, you know, this communion of humanity. That's awesome. Um, what skills do you think young musicians studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? And we've talked about many already. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think, um, I think something that, uh, that is very important is learning how to create opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, things, there are an awful lot of people, it's a big world and there are an awful lot of people that want to do what you want to do. <laughs> and um, and things are changing a lot too. You know, so many of the institutions that were established, orchestras, um, even schools, you know, things are changing and we need to adapt so much. Yeah. And I think that... Uh, it, you can't expect, no matter how well you play, you can't expect things to just happen for you. If there's a project that you're passionate about, you need to find ways to bring that to other people. You can't just sit back and expect people to take notice because there are just too many gifted people around that are being proactive. So I think being proactive in one's career is, is very important. That's great. Um, you mentioned reading earlier. Do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to our listeners? You know, I have a lot of favorite books. Uh, my favorite books tend to be whatever I'm reading at the moment. But I would say that the book that has remained a favorite and that I, I return to um, periodically is David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. And that I think that uh, just about anyone you will ever meet in your life, you will also meet in that book. And you come across characters that um, since the first time I read it, I, I meet people very frequently. And I just kind of laugh to myself and say, yeah, I know you. I, I've met you before. <laughs> you know what? I've never read this book, but uh, I'm definitely going to now for sure. It's great. It's absolutely great. <laughs> and is there an advice that uh, you've received in the past that you would like to transmit now? You know what? Um, I, I got this. This came up in conversation with a very dear friend of mine, a wonderful cellist named Jan Vogler. Um, we were talking about kind of the, the unpleasant experience of when you have to play sort of an audition type scenario, whether it's an actual audition for, for a job or for a, a place in a school or an orchestra, or, or whether you're playing for a conductor, whatever kind of situation it is, that those kinds of awkward audition type scenarios. Uh, he made the very brilliant point that once you get to a certain level 
of proficiency, you know, sort of a professional level. Um, the difference between your very best and your very worst is not as big as you think. And that basically we tend to sound the way we sound. And if somebody likes your playing, they are willing to forgive almost anything. And if someone doesn't like your playing, there's nothing you can do to change that. And, you know, when you think about that, when, like when you listen to a a quality player, you know, sort of a professional level player, you know right away whether you, you like it or you don't. And and it's not about whether they nailed that shift or whether that harmonic squeaked or, you know, it's really, it's not about that. It's about whether you connect to their playing or not. And if you can remember that, then I think it's so, it's so freeing because you just have to, to think, well, this is what I do. And if you like it, great. I hope you do. And if you don't, well, there's not really anything I can do about that. Yeah, that's so true. So much of the anxiety related to performance is this perception that we will be judged harshly. Yes. Thank you so much. This is great advice. Um, so be before I let you go, how about a quick actionable tip that um, our listeners can implement today in their musical lives? Well, we talked about this a bit before, but I really think what I would encourage um, students to do is to learn how to truly listen to what you're doing in an, the most objective way possible. And, you know, nowadays we all have access to such wonderful technology. I mean, you can take out your phone and record yourself and it can be something simple, something that you feel, you know, really, really well and play it. And then listen to it and say, is, did that sound the way I thought it sounded? You know, and it's particularly um, eye opening, I think, to challenge oneself on things that you think you do well. You know, don't necessarily listen to, well, I sound bad in this part. I want to sound, figure out why I sound bad. But <clears throat> challenge yourself to say, oh, I sound really good when I do this. This is what makes my playing special. And then listen to it. Say, is that really how I want to sound? Does my vibrato really sound like that? Am I doing, am I doing this particular musical gesture because that's how I feel the music needs to be? Or am I doing this as a crutch to get around some sort of a technical hurdle? Um, and I think developing that kind of um, musical objectivity and objectivity of, of listening um, is one of the most valuable things that you can do. Ah. Oh. This is so great. Thank you so much. Um, how about a project? Do you have a, a an upcoming project? I know you always have many going on, but that that you're excited about that you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit about? Sure. Well, you know, there's there's a couple of of things that that I've been very excited about recently. I mean, it, coming out in I think within within the, the coming month, so in in September. Um, there's going to be a release of a CD that's very special to me, and that it's three pieces that were written for me and that I premiered, uh, two violin concerti, uh, one by Aaron J. Kernis and, uh, the other by James Newton Howard, and then a violin and piano piece, um, called Stream of Limelight by Bramwell Tovey. And, uh, these three composers are also three very dear friends of mine. Uh, the pieces are very different, um, but they're each fantastic in their own way. And, uh, the, the concerti were recorded live, uh, the Kernis in Seattle and the Howard in Detroit and the, uh, the Toby pieces with one of my most regular and beloved musical colleagues, uh, my friend, Andy Armstrong. So that's a, a project that has meant a lot to me and I'm, I'm excited for that to, uh, to finally come out and hopefully people enjoy that. And, um, as far as things kind of coming into the future, there's so many things I'm looking forward to, but one thing I feel very lucky about is that for the uh, the upcoming big Beethoven celebrations in 2020, which will be his 250th birthday, uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of a lot of Beethoven in a lot of my my favorite cities, performing you know the concerto and the romances and the triple concerto, and in many places uh, the complete cycle of the ten sonatas for violin and piano. So um, that's a very exciting thing to be involved in such you know an iconic project uh during such an important anniversary oh wow that sounds incredible you know i'm gonna put um 
links to a lot of the things that we talked about today and of of course you know your website but do you have a um favorite place where our listeners could find information about all those things you know it's it's a shame because my website is um kind of dead at the moment <laughs> and uh, we're we're in the process of creating a new one that hopefully will be a, a fun site with access to everything and hopefully it'll be clear and concise and helpful and all that but uh but yeah jamesennis.com eventually will be back to life and um and that hopefully will be a good resource for people that are looking to see what i'm up to i'll investigate and see if i can find the links to these recordings and put them in the show notes and i'll put your instagram handle as well if that's if that's okay with you yeah that's great sure yeah well james i cannot thank you enough for accepting my invitation to being here today oh real pleasure i always tell people that um in addition to be one of the world's greatest violinists, I, I think you're a truly wonderful person. And I think that everyone listening today can hear that. So, um, you know, I think the insight you gave us is so valuable and I think it's going to prove to be an inspiration for everyone listening. You said, I mean, you said so many things that are so important for musicians of all backgrounds and all levels to hear. Um, you know, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you. I think it's a wonderful thing what you're doing, focusing on these these very important topics of how to practice, how to prepare. Um, you know, it, it's something that that we don't spend enough time thinking about. So I hope that some of what I said today will hopefully register with with uh, a few people out there. Thank you, James. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode with James Ennis at mindoverfinger.com. I would also love to connect with you, so join the conversation on social media. I am Mind Over Finger on all platforms. Next week, I'll be talking with the awesome host of Contrabass Conversation, Jason Heath, and we're going to discuss practicing and building a fulfilling portfolio career. If you have the chance, please take a minute and head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Again, thank you and à bientôt.